Hello? 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 Rubbish. Hello? Hello? Better. OK, right, I've got 22 minutes to talk about the entire future, so let's crack on. Uh, what do I do? Uh, just briefly, I run a consultancy called We Do Things Differently, and we are a cultural change cult uh, uh, consultancy, and we help people change their, uh, their culture to make, so that they can make the world more sustainable and just and humane, that kind of thing. These are some of our clients. Uh, but all of the people who work for this company are also independently successful artists, writers, or performers, because we believe that Stevie Wonder knows as much about cultural change as McKinsey. Um, and that means occasionally I write a book. So this is my first book, and this is the one that I'm writing at the moment. And that's about me. So when we think about the future, I often think about technology. Douglas Adams said there were three types of technology. There's technology invented before you are born, which you don't think of as technology. It is just there. Sewers, uh, textiles, chairs. These things are technologies. We don't really think of them as technologies, so... We're ambivalent about those. Then there's technology invented between you being born and your middle age, 35, 40, which uh, is very exciting. And you can probably change the world with it. Uh, you know, for my generation, that's things like the internet and mobile phones. Uh, you can tell I'm old because I say mobile phones. Anybody under the age of 30 just says phone. Um, <laughs> so we're very happy about those. And then there's technology invented after your middle age, which is completely pointless and makes you angry. <laughs> <laughs> and for my generation, uh, that's things like uh, 3D television and Twitter. Uh, I have friends who are literally furious that Twitter even exists. Now, um, by the way, just so we know, my, 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 my Twitter handle is not optimist on two, okay? Just if you want to, there's an R on the end of that. Um, now, whilst that is quite funny, it's also, I think, unwittingly profound, because in the work that we do, we often find that the people who decide the strategic direction of an organization, or a government, a family, a school, are in the last category, usually, and the people that they're trying to engage with are often in the second. And that leads to what I call institutional bewilderment, where organizations uh, look at new technologies or new ways of thinking and go, I have no idea what to do with that. And I'm going to give an example from my own life. I had my genetic code profile uh, when I was researching my last book, and I can log onto a database and look at various things to do with my genetics, including some estimations of my disease risks. Turns out that my arse is the weak link, genetically speaking. <laughs> so, Average risk of getting prostate cancer for a white Northern European male, about 18%. As you can see, a couple of mutations on my, genetic, on my genome puts me at nearly double that. I know because of the work I do with medical research charities that this puts me into the same risk category as black men. Black men in the UK have a two to three times higher risk of getting prostate cancer than white guys. So the NHS very sensibly encourages black men about the age of 40 to get early screening for the disease. I go to my doctor, I show my uh, genetic data and say, look, I'm, I'm falling into roughly the same risk category. Maybe I should have um, some early screening. What does my doctor say? No, and what she actually said was, you do realize you're not black, Mr. Stevens. <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, I do know that, but, you know. Uh, <laughs> she said, the rule's pretty simple. Uh, if, you're, if you're black, I can recommend the test. If you're white, I can't. Is my doctor a racist? Is my doctor a racist? <laughs> it's a difficult question to ask, because some people say yes, some people say no. And actually, I can tell you, for a fact, that my doctor's not a racist. She's a very lovely woman. But you could argue that the, the NHS is being institutionally racist because it's hanging on to a way of thinking about things that doesn't quite make sense anymore in the light of new technology. And we're seeing that everywhere now. The gap between what we do and what we could do is getting ever wider, not just in the healthcare, but in the way we govern ourselves, in the way we educate our children, the way we run our corporations, which is indeed, I think, what this conference is all about. Um, I was recently asked to react to the Davos summit, the world's most boring summit, never go. Um, <laughs> And one of the things that was quoted at that summit quite a lot was this, was this report from McKinsey, where they quoted a CEO saying, technology is changing five times faster than management. I was asked, what do I think about that? I said, I think it's wrong. I think technology is accelerating five times faster than management. Uh, but it's always been that way, OK? Technology has always been speeding up. Uh, this is a distribution graph. shows you how long it takes 25% of the American population to adopt a new technology from its inception. So 46 years for electricity just seven for the World Wide Web. And there's two and a half times as many Americans when the World Wide Web arrives. This makes perfect sense, because each technology provides a platform for the other technology to build upon. You can't have the World Wide Web before electricity. It doesn't work that way around. Uh, the other thing I love about this graph is even though I got it from the National Intelligence Council in America, they spelt television wrong. Now, <laughs> um, one of the things, uh, that, uh, what, the most obvious way that we've seen this, kind of, uh, this, this massive sort of leap forward in technology and how it changes our lives is, of course, through the uh, increasing power of computing per dollar. So right back from Babbage, we've had this exponential growth in computing power per dollar. In fact, we've had a billion-fold increase in computing power since 1965, which is a surprising thought, except we're not surprised by it. We just accept the fact that our mobile phones have more processing power in them than the Apollo space program. Um, I'm surprised. We're not more surprised, quite frankly. I think it's quite surprising, but we're not surprised about it, which is in itself surprising. Um, but one of the things that... Uh, the, 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 what I love about this is, is, is things happen that previously seemed impossible, and then we begin to accept them. So five years ago, the idea of a car that drove itself 
would have seemed pretty ridiculous. Most people have gone, no, technology can't do that. It's, that's a, that's, it involves value judgments. It's very human. You couldn't get, a, couldn't get a, something to drive a car. It's ridiculous. Anyway, I just want to show you a little bit of the clip of uh, some guys getting into a driverless car at a conference in America. Here we go. The Gantz team will never believe this. Oh, thing. my goodness. Go is the right word. Holy shit. Whoa. Holy shit. There's no fucking hands on that wheel. Oh, my God. <laughs> what? It's driving itself. <laughs> ah! Anyway, guys, we've got a well, uh, You can find it on YouTube. Now, I was introduced to that clip by a man called Salem Ishmael at the Singularity University. And Salem said this brilliant thing about it. He said, What you can hear there is the sound of new technology hitting somebody's brain <laughs> and changing the way they think forever. Now, those people will never think about a car in the same way again. So, we've gone from something that's impossible to something that's a change into emotions to something that's going to legislation by January in the UK to allow these things onto the roads. So, so this is from something impossible to legislation. Now I've been working with some insurance companies and they're wondering what to do about this because what happens in this situation where one of these is a driverless car, or both of them? So on the one hand, they're going, well, this is very bad for our business because we insure drivers. If there are no drivers, what's going to happen to our business model? On the other hand, they're thinking, well, actually, maybe it's a good thing because it turns out that human beings are shit at driving cars. We are terrible at it. And the reason I know this is because uh, when the BlackBerry messenger system went down in Abu Dhabi for a weekend, the crash rate went down by 40% because nobody was texting while they were driving. So. So on the other hand, it might be, oh, great, so you know, maybe we'll have less claims, so maybe that's a good thing. So this is an example of how you get technology moving very quickly into the, into the mind, into legislation, and then actually changing the way business can work, which offers huge opportunities and huge threats as well. Um, and that's another example of what's happening, of course, is the plummeting cost of genome sequencing. Uh, $100 million a sequence of genome in 2001, 1,000 today. 1,000. We've got this. So that's, that's outstripping Moore's law, the computing law, by a factor of four since 2008, which means the $1 human genome is going to be here by the end of the decade, and the one cent human genome will be here by the end of the next which could change everything about medicine. You can start to do really interesting things, like when it gets that cheap, you can sequence individual cells from the same patient and compare them, something that would have been impossible to, to think about even a few years ago, and now we can actually do that. It's been done in a few, a few studies, so I'm going to show you a pretty um, upsetting picture. This is a PET scan, and pretty much all the bl black blobs on uh, that scan, except for the kidney-shaped one between the legs, are tumors. This is a dead man walking. Uh, it's a melanoma that's gone inside him and infected all his organs. Now, his doctors um, sequenced two cells from him, one that was cancerous, one that was healthy, and compared them. They were able to see at the genetic level what the cancer was doing to him, because every cancer is individual to the patient. And they worked out there was an experimental drug that would target the proteins that were being generated by the, the, the cancerous cell. Um, uh, it wasn't approved yet, but, you know, this guy has got nothing to lose. He is going to die. So they give it to him, and this is the scan 15 days later. It's not science fiction. So what you're looking at there is the programming of somebody out of their cancer at a genetic level. So this is quite interesting stuff that suddenly means, oh, hang on, things are changing. Technology is changing things quite dramatically. Um, uh, and not only are we reading genomes, we're writing them. So, you know, we are now got technology that will change, for instance, an E. coli bacteria, eat uh, carbon dioxide, eat water, and excrete crude oil. I'll just say that again. Eat carbon dioxide, eat water, excrete crude oil. This stuff is already happening. This is actually happening. You know, these are four companies that do this, and there's about another 25 that I'm keeping an eye on. Um, so when people say we should ban genetically modified organisms, you kind of go, well, I don't know. What do you, what, I don't know. Should we? I mean, in some cases, very bad. Other places, pretty interesting. By the way, um, all of the uh, insulin that diabetics have is genetically modified. So I was actually with an anti-GMO activist the other day who was a diabetic, and I explained this to them, and now they're still sat there wondering what to think. <laughs> Um, these people at the moment are getting their CO2 from the fossil fuel industry in big tankers. I sit on the advisory board of this. This is Virgin Earth Challenge, uh, $25 million prize put up by Sir Richard for anybody who can take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere in an environmentally sustainable way and make a profit while they're doing it. We had 2,600 applications to the prize, most of them from mad people in sheds. Uh, we're down to 11 finalists. And I was doing some consulting work with Audi. We introduced Audi to the prize, and now Audi have done a deal with Climeworks, one of our finalists, to take carbon dioxide out of the air and turn it into fuel for Audi cars, and they're building a pilot plant right now in Switzerland. The Solar Fuels Institute are putting together researchers from all over the world to create basically this, which is something that uses artificial photosynthesis to make petrol in your back garden from the sky. They can already do it. It's very expensive at the moment, but it's dropping exponentially in price. And their best guess is that the first commercial projects, products will hit, the, hit in niche markets in early in the next decade. I also sit on the Fuels and Transport Committee at the Institute of Mechanical Engineers, and that's our best guess as well when we're having a pint and nobody's asking us to be official. Um, and what does this do to the world? You know, just another example. We don't get any of that, which is nice. Don't get any of this, which is much better. <laughs> uh, and regardless of, uh, regardless of what you think about um, uh, politics, that saves a lot, of, uh, a lot of cash. I got that from the Treasury, so it's almost certainly a lie. That's how much we spent 
doing that. Could we have spent that money better, do you think? Like on anything else, like on anything else. <laughs> Education, peace initiatives, researching new kinds of fuel. Okay. Um, you know, just, that's just a very extreme example of the gap between what we could do and what we do do and how technology allows us to do things that actually we don't do because we're still thinking in old institutional ways. Um, this is what's happened to the cost of solar power. Again, showing an exponential uh, drop in price. Uh, the uh, fossil fuel industry will tell you that solar power only produces 1% of our energy needs and therefore it's a sideshow. This tells you one of two things about the fossil fuel lobby. They're either stupid or disingenuous. I will leave you to guess which. Um, it's doubling, okay? So if you're at 1%, how many doublings to 100%? About six and a half. Um, this is not me saying this, this is the fossil fuel industry saying this. Actually, this is a report they recently wrote about solar power. This is the executive summary. Um, <laughs> I was just in Brazil looking at new systems of governance. This is a hacked energy grid. In a few years' time, these people are going to have their own solar power. That will change the entire economy of the favela, uh, favela and, by extension, the nation of Brazil. Uh, this is the Green Tea Coalition. These are Greens and Tea Party members coming together to form coalitions to fight corporate America, to, be, to battle their utilities who saying you can't have um, solar power on your roof. You know the world is changing when basically left-leaning, you know, Hessian-wearing, you know, sandal tree-huggers, sandal-wearing tree-huggers are partnering with gun-toting, right-wing, crazy, you know, illusion-denying evangelists to fight corporate America. That, you know, we know that things have changed. This is what's happening in, in renewables. This is just an example of what's happened recently. This company, uh, supported by the National Research Labs, has come up with a way to increase the throughput of solar panels by 100% and half the cost. This is what Deutsche Bank is saying, that solar electricity will be cheaper uh, than the average electricity bill in 47 U.S. states by 2016. We don't have an energy crisis, we have an energy conversion crisis, and we may be about to solve it. And then all of our politics and all of our uh, economics is the economics and politics of energy. So think about what's going to happen when we have uh, uh, energy too cheap to meet it. Manufacturing revolution, the cutting edge of uh, 3D printing is quite interesting. These are 3D printed car parts, 3D printed body parts. This lady's come out with a way to make 3D printed cosmetics. She worked out that actually what most cosmetics are is the same kind of paste. You know, whatever's in a, a lipstick or foundation is pretty much the same. But uh, what you buy is the color. Um, and she's worked out that all the colors that you might buy from, you know, Chanel or whatever are already in your inkjet printer. So she's combining those two technologies. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, I was doing some work with Condé Nast and Vogue magazine recently. By the way, I hate Vogue magazine. It's a horrible, shitty magazine with an awful way of thinking about the world. Uh, and I told them so. Uh, but they're also a bit worried about, um, you know, about what will happen to their advertising revenues if this stuff starts happening. These people are printing 3D printed uh, body parts, so uh, proto-organs um, that they can test drugs on. And the guy who runs this company said, give me 10 years, I'll print you the human heart. Not the one you have now, but something better. 3D printed dresses, and the most important company you've never heard of, Nanoscribe. Nanoscribe, 3D print on the nanoscale, which is 80,000 times smaller than the human hair. The first thing they printed was this, not very, uh, this, this replica spaceship from the not very successful science fiction movie, Wing Commander. This tells you quite a lot about the people who work at Nanoscribe. <laughs> then they start printing scaffolds for holding cells, and now they're printing on the nanoscale components for microchips. And they're printing those components in less than two minutes each. What this points to is a world sometime in our future, and I won't say when, where 3D printers will be able to print all of the components necessary to make 3D printers. At which point, most of the assumptions, especially if you combine it with the energy revolution of industrial capitalism, fall away. We need to think about things differently. You have to imagine a world where your mobile phone never runs out of power because the solar panel is so good, where that mobile phone can give you a blood test, and based on that blood test, you can download a drug and print it at home. Already happening. This is going to be released next year. It's, a, it's from Alcatel. It's a phone where the, the screen is a solar panel. You can already attach a, a blood, te blood test to your iPhone, and they're combining into single devices. There's even a prize for it. Yes, it's called the Tricorder Prize. It's a Star Trek reference. <laughs> and these two chaps have basically machines that will assemble pharmaceuticals. By the time your kids are your age, they will be able to print their own drugs at home. There is a parenting <laughs> challenge for you. Um, <laughs> right now, they're hanging out with places like this and they're hacking their own, their own fuel. This is where Bill Gates and Steve Jobs of new biotech revolution are hanging out, along with a generation of bioterrorists we have no idea what to do with. Digital, I'm afraid, which everybody talks about, was the cocktail sausage before dinner. It was the trailer. Digital is old. The same level of democratization and power that we've seen in the digital world is coming to the physical world through programmable biology, programmable matter, and energy too cheap to meter. This is the industrial revolution times 100. It's going to change the definition of wealth. Because when the person on the average wage has a 3D printer that prints a 3D printer and energy too cheap to meet it, your ability to influence him because of the money in your bank account has kind of eroded. And so the really smart billionaires I work with are realizing that if they want to still maintain their influence in the world, they better start showing some moral leadership. They better increase their social capital, which is why uh, conferences like this are so important. Because smart people have begin to realize if they want to have any influence in the world that's coming, they better start saying interesting things about climate change, social justice, and poverty. Most companies won't be able to manage it, 
because as Upton Sinclair said, it's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on him not understanding it, which is most of us. Uh, don't believe me? Who remembers them? Anybody remember them? Yeah, yeah a few of you. So they, were, they were all disappeared, they all disappeared. So who's next if they don't get it? These people. Which means, as John Seeley Brown says, nearly every social and technical and business infrastructure we have can't survive. Morning. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to which my answer is, thank God, because the systems we have are a bit shit, you may have noticed. Um, the political system, this is Hansard, every year does a report on the English political system and basically says every year, oh my God, it's got worse and we didn't think it could. A disengaged and disillusioned public. It gets to the point where Jeremy Paxman agrees with Russell Brand uh, that neither of them vote because they both think the system is broken and they both agree with PJ O'Rourke who said don't vote, it just encourages the bastards. <laughs> we have an energy system that can't keep pace with demand and is visiting on us an environmental crisis of unprecedented proportions. We have a financial system that is completely uh, subject to systemic risk and completely out of step with most people's perceptions of value. My favorite example is this. This is my friend Jules. I met him when I was six years old. He's still my best friend. He has three degrees. He's a paramedic. We pay him £30,000 a year. This is Andy Hornby, the ex-CEO of HBOS, a colossal failure by the Banking Standards Commission's uh, opinion, and we pay him £2 million a year. Saves lives, arsehole. Saves lives, arsehole. <laughs> Saves lives, arsehole. This is a report from Pat and Suckdef, ex-Deutsche Bank guy, who's trying to work out how much we're extracting from the environment in terms of financial value that at some point we're going to have to pay back because, as Gaylord Nelson said, the environment is, uh, sorry, the economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment. How much are we taking from the environment uh, and not putting back? About 4.7 trillion a year. We have a workplaces where, according to the annual Gallup survey, about 87% of people are not engaged with their jobs. How did we get to that? 87% of people. If you, most people, probably not at this conference, but most people at the places where we all work don't give a shit. We have a sick care system, not a health care system. One of my favorite reports out recently from the Health Foundation and the NHS, hospitals more dangerous than bungee jumping. <laughs> and we have an education system which is not teaching our children about the future that's coming, it's teaching about them the past they've had. This is what a uh, classroom looks like in 1895, this is what a classroom looks like today. Fantastic. Uh, but these changes are coming, whether we like it or not, which is why conferences like this are so important, because hopefully we're going to start thinking about this thing, and because the future's up for grabs, and maybe we can use these big changes that are coming to do something useful and important and just and humane. Uh, and it is definitely coming. When, when my clients say, I don't want to think about that because it affects my business, and uh, my salary doesn't really pay me to think about that, I always quote Philip K. Dick, who said, reality is that which, when you stop believing in it, doesn't go away. There isn't a record company executive anywhere in the world right now that doesn't want to wake up tomorrow morning and find out the internet had just been a bad dream. But the reality is that which, when you stop thinking about it, doesn't go away. And these technologies, 3D printing and cheap renewables and synthetic biology are coming whether we like it or not. And if you don't understand these things, you can end up having um, difficult times. I was recently talking to a whole bunch of petroleum uh, people, which was very weird. Uh, but I basically said to them, if you don't understand what's happening with renewables, you're going to end up like Detroit. This is a street in Detroit on Street View in 2009, 2011, 2013. This is a city that didn't understand that its industry was changing. Now, here's the thing. Most people say they want to innovate, don't they? Who, don't we want to, who wants to innovate? Everybody, right? Don't I mean? All my clients come to me and go, we want to innovate. We really do. We really want to innovate. And what I've realized is that nobody really wants to innovate, or very few people. What they want is innovation wash, which is the appearance of innovating without changing a bloody thing. It's getting McKinsey to come in and rewrite your company manual with the word creativity in it and charging you 300 grand and not changing anything. I work with lots of, uh, you know, we do a lot of work in education, you know, and I, I'm always told, you know, you know that, that we're innovating in education. Yeah, they're really innovating. It's amazing what they've done in the last 150 years. Um, why culture eat strategy for breakfast? We know this. We can all know this stuff, but if the culture of your organization isn't there to embrace sustainability and humanity and justice, and you really think about the culture of your company or the place that you work, then nothing will change. So if you look at the digital revolution as a trailer, for instance, it wasn't invented by the incumbents because the incumbents didn't have the right the right culture. You know, why was PayPal not invented by a bank? It's not like I didn't have the expertise to do it, it just didn't have the right culture, didn't think about it in the right way. And Skype was invented by two guys in a flat in Tallinn, Estonia. Why wasn't it invented by BT? The world is Darwinian in the end for everybody, including corporations and governments. It's not the fittest that survive, it's the most agile. That's why conferences like this are important because we are hopefully increasing our agility by thinking about these things in important and interesting ways. So where do we look? Maybe it's the island of Samso, completely off-grid, 4,000 people. What's happened to its economy, do you think? Social networks for patients now directing their own medical research. I've just been come back from India where I've been looking at open source drug discovery. First new drug for tuberculosis gone into human trials after two years of open source development. Hasn't been a new drug for tuberculosis since 1963 before that. Online courses. But it is possible for big companies to do it. And there are some interesting examples. So Unilever's interesting. This is Paul Polman from Unilever. 
Um, there's lots of things wrong with Unilever, but he's trying to change that. And he said, uh, he stood up in front of the Confederation of British Industry and said, um, how much longer are we going to steal from our children's future? I'm going to halve Unilever's environmental footprint, and I'm going to double our revenues. If you're a hedge fund, I don't want your money. <coughs> Interesting. People said he was crazy, but look what's happened to their share price since he was announced. So, so you can get it. With strong leadership in big organizations, it can happen. And now Paul has joined force with Sir Richard and a few other people to try and get that mindset into large companies. Whether they succeed or not, and there's a lot of criticisms of how they're going about it, whether they succeed or not is you know, questionable. But the fact that they're doing it means there is something in the water that we all get this. Um, as uh, Alistair Campbell said to me, that the public are demanding the efficiency of the private sector and the public sector and the social mandate of the public sector in the private sector, and soon they will accept nothing less. The, even the idea of this conference wouldn't have been around in te about 10 years ago. Um, so to finish off, let's think about it. The good, the bad, the ugly. The bad is that most of our organizations are not fit for purpose. The good is that we do have these wonderful tools to remake our world. And the ugly is it's going to get messy. Because we're going through a revolution that will make the industrial revolution look like a storm in a teacup. If we thought about the digital revolution as a trailer, it told us that we no longer had to just be passive consumers of information. We could be publishers as well if we wanted to. And we understand that if it doesn't interact with us, somehow it's broken. Well, that's coming everywhere else. What does it mean? It means power is coming to us. And as Victor Frankl, sorry, as uh, Franklin Roosevelt, that's not Victor Frankl, Franklin Roosevelt and Spider-Man said, with power comes responsibility. <laughs> and with mass power comes mass responsibility. Our governments won't be able to legislate for this kind of stuff. We'll have to do it in our hearts. Victor Frankl said, when we erected the Statue of Liberty on the East Coast, we forgot to erect a Statue of Liberty, sorry, a Statue of Responsibility on the West Coast. What you're doing here at this conference, I'm hoping, is beginning to erect some statues of responsibility. It's a world where we become citizen and state. We cannot predict the future, but we can make ourselves ready for it, which is why I'm very happy to speak here today and open this conference. I'll tell you how, why you can't predict the future, because you just can't predict the second, third, or the fourth order effects of technology. Here's some great examples. Man will not fly for 50 years. Wilbur Wright, 1901. He was building an airplane at the time. Who the hell wants to hear actors talk? Henry Warner, Warner Studios, 1927. You'd think you'd have an idea. And of course, the most famous one, I think there's a world market for maybe five computers. This is the chairman of IBM. <laughs> now, if these people can't get it right, what chance do we have? What's interesting is that nobody laughed at those statements at the time. Because they all made perfect sense, given the culture of the time and what was happening. <coughs> so when you find yourself laughing at the idea of 3D printed drugs at home, be careful, because otherwise you might end up on a slide like this in 20 years' time. See, the future and technology it's just a mirror, and it just asks us what kind of world we want. As we look into that mirror, if we don't see a world of compassion and humanity and justice, then we all better be prepared for the consequences. That's why this event is so important, because it's asking us to look into that mirror. I'm going to finish with two quotes. Catherine the Great, great wind is blowing. That either gives you imagination or a headache. I hope my job this morning is to give you a little bit of both. But finally, ancient Chinese wisdom. When the winds of change blow, some people build walls, some people build windmills. This is a room of the windmills. I'm very happy to speak to you. Thank you for listening.